I am Lydia Caprellian. I work on Science in the Classroom. It's a project out of AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. If you're not from Washington, D.C., it's just another one of the um, alphabet acronyms that people start talking in, so uh, sorry about that in advance. Um, but so if I ever say something, like some jargon thing, please just say what. Um, that would be helpful for me because sometimes I forget. Um, so in general, we're here because we use hypothesis every day in our work. Um, Science in the Classroom, we provide annotated uh, primary literature, primary scientific research. Um, it's freely available for anybody to use. Um, and it is mostly for high school and college students uh, studying science. Okay. So in this presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about why we use annotated primary research, uh, scientific literature, and how we can use that in order to um, bridge the gap between scientists and everybody else. And I think hopefully you'll realize that everybody's a little bit of a scientist as well. <laughs> okay, uh, so I want to tell you what we are, or who we are. Maybe if we have time, we'll do a site tour. Otherwise, I hope to be here tomorrow um, and we, I can demo how we use Hypothesis and our um, site in general. And also, you are, of course, welcome to check it out on your own time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we annotate, um, who's all involved in our annotation community, and the wrap-up and Q&A and that sort of stuff. Okay, so what is science in the classroom? So, again, we are a freely available uh, repository of annotated primary scientific research. So, AAAS, where um, our project is housed, uh, AAAS publishes the science family of journals. So, that's uh, science, science advances, science robotics, science immunology, etc. And um, because of that, we have access to, I mean, the basics is that we have access to their copyright and that sort of thing. So it means that since we have all these great papers, why don't we get them out into the world and get them in a way that uh, students can see and understand and have, again, ready access to. Um, so I think it's important to explain why we're using primary research or primary literature. Um, a big thing for using primary research is so that students see what the end result or how scientists communicate with each other because it's very different. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to read one of the science papers, science research papers. They're really technical, really jargony, very dense, um, and can be very inaccessible for a lot of people. And basically, they're only read to be understood by not even just scientists, but scientists in that particular field. So it's very, um, it's a very closed kind of communication, and that can be very difficult for people outside of that specific community to understand. Um, so using primary research, we want to make sure that students have access and can see what this end um, result is, but then also give them the tools to understand it and help them along with it. Um, and we think it's really uh, useful because then they can see, oh, look, there's an ecologist that contributed to this paper. Oh, that's also a computer scientist on that paper. And hey, there's that author that's also from an HBCU. So you can kind of see that like there's a huge diversity of scientists that are coming together to work on this one paper. Um, and that can be really powerful for students to say, hey, like that person looks like me or I want to be like that person when I grow up, um, to see the scientists themselves is really important. Okay, so when we say annotated, I want to show you what this means on our website. Um, so uh, our GIF is working. Um, and so you can see that we annotate with different colors according to different topics in our learning lens. Um, so some of them are um, glossary terms, so that's definitions like, hey, I don't know what um, a crossover means or I don't know what a microsatellite marker is, for example, and a little annotation will pop up and you can basically define that word. Um, we also have results and conclusions to, to kind of highlight to students, hey, like, um, this is the big idea of this paper and this is what they found and this is how they found it. Um, 
We have authors' experiments as well, so they can kind of get a sense of how um, students came to that conclusion and, and the different ways that they were achieving that. Like, were they using um, PCR? Were they using microscopes? Were they using some sort of computer code, something like that? Um, they can get a sense for what that means. So again, we separate out our annotations into different categories. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how Hypothesis helps us do that. So our tar target audience, like I said, is grade 13, so that's advanced high school, early college. These are people who are probably taking an introductory science course, so um, you know, an introductory biology course, let's say, and they're learning about photosynthesis. Well, instead of just learning about photosynthesis from a textbook, here's like an actual research of how photosynthesis is understood and used by scientists to understand other things. Um, that can be helpful so that it becomes a little bit more um, relevant, I guess, instead of just being, oh, this is something that I need to learn for that test on Friday. Um, so again, we want to give them as many tools as we can to understand that original paper because it can be very intimidating. So we want to leave minimal white space. We want to have all, very much of the paper annotated in one way or another. Okay, so again, I encourage you all to check out our website. Um, I don't know if we'll do that now. Okay, so a little bit about how to become an annotator and who these annotators are. So they are practicing scientists or educators. They're often early career scientists looking to really prove that, hey, I'm a scientist and I can communicate and I can write because scientists are always told that they don't know how to do either of those things. And this gives them a deliverable to say, hey, I can talk. Um, and uh, so we kind of go through this different process to make sure that um, what, how they're annotating um, is both beneficial for students, it's true, so to make sure that it's, you know, scientific accuracy is ensured, and also, you know, it's, it's readable um, to make sure that, you know, there's good sentence structure and that sort of thing. So uh, annotators go through, quite frankly, a kind of boring online training. We need to uh, update our um, videos to make them a little bit less painful to watch because they're a little slow right now. But um, this is really an important step, even if it might be a little bit boring, because we want to make sure that um, scientists are understanding why they're doing this and that they get a bit of an education as well to say, um, you know, this is why I am doing this annotation. This is how it can help students. This is how it can help a diverse array of students, make sure that you're speaking to a diverse array of students. You don't want it to be thinking about, oh, hey, maybe that language is actually kind of excluding some people. So we ask them to also fill out an accompanying resources worksheet. This is really helpful for educators to be able to use our um, annotated primary research. It's not exactly a lesson plan, but it gives them all the tools that are there. So it has activities, um, discussion questions, um, and maybe sadly, most importantly, an explanation of how it fits into different um, standards, education standards, education networks, um, because uh, teachers often need to prove to administrators or whatever that, hey, like this lesson plan is relevant to AP standards, NGSS, um, et cetera. Okay, so we use Hypothesis. <laughs> and um, it's really helpful for us because um, annotators are able to tag, this is just an example from our one of our more recent papers. Um, they can tag with different terms, they can add links so that they can reach out, uh, they can link out to other, um, <coughs> other resources to say like, hey, you know, there's this really good website that has this example, or hey, this is how this paper was covered in the popular media, let's say Scientific American, Washington Post, something like that picked it up. Here's how it was interpreted by journalists to become a popular paper. Um, and in our, uh, in order for us to go about editing these annotations that these students, or that these annotators and early career scientists make, um, again, we also use John Udell's facet, it's great. <laughs> um, and it's helpful for us to be able to, once we have their API keys, we're able to edit um, the annotator's comments and annotations um, so that, you know, A, we're correcting if there are any uh, errors, the, um, the original papers, the original authors that were writing the paper can go in and 
um, correct anything that happened there. We can also edit it or just ask clarifying questions as a reply or edit it, the original paper. Um, I also wanted to just say that it's really nice, again, that we can have multiple users that are talking on the same document. That is really valuable for our work. Um, here, you know, Sitsi, that's, that's me, I said that. <laughs> and then we have Claire, who is um, our annotator, and then our copy editor is also able to, to you know, make notes in there as well. Okay, uh, so here is all the people that are involved and how, um, basically to say that our, our product, our like base is that we produce these really high quality annotated research papers. Um, but we also do a bunch of other things that kind of support that production and make sure that it's being used and is valuable to um, the world. So we have educator guides. This is kind of an unfortunate still that I grabbed. But <laughs> um, this is Shelby on our team. I'm sure he'd love, uh, love that. Um, but yeah, so we're going to have um, an online video course for creating these educator guides coming out soon. Um, hopefully during the summer when teachers have time to read and look at some of these things instead of during the school year. Um, and this is helpful so that a, so that educators can know how to um, use our resources and that scientists know what educators need. And so oftentimes those environments aren't, don't necessarily have a lot of opportunity to cross and we are at a good, good space to be able to do those things. Um, in addition, we do research. So this is our research director, uh, Dr. Melissa McCartney. She does a lot of, um, you know, she... She does the research to make sure that annotated primary research papers are something that are useful and relevant for both the annotators who do the work. So, hey, when annotators are annotating, um, is this useful for them? Like, are they getting benefit out of it? Because we don't want this to be just for, um, just for students and educators. We also want to make sure that the scientists who are working on it um, are getting value out of it and that's value added for them. And then we also want to see how annotations are helpful for students. Not even the act of annotating, uh, but more the act of the additional layer of information that's on that original research paper. Is it, how, how does this help them understand, um, or is it? Um, and so far, her research shows that it is. Um, this is a recently published paper that she, um, that she got approved in um, PLOS. Additionally, we do um, focus groups with educators. Um, those are our main findings. The idea is that we just want to see like how they how they're using primary research and how we can help them use it more. Because I think generally we have found that teachers really want to be able to use primary research. It's not even primary research, but they want to have like, hey, this is you know real research or this is like a real figure from a real paper, um, because then it's not just like some mock up. Um, and students, again, are able to, able to see the relevance of what's going on in the classroom. Um, and again, it came up that for educators that they really like the idea of showing the wide diversity and collaboration among scientists, because so rare is it one researcher publishing a paper. It's oftentimes a huge team. They're backed up by a lot of different levels and disciplines of understanding. And seeing that all together is really useful. Um, we also have professional development workshops with high school and college educators. Uh, we're recruiting for our next one. So if any of you know anybody who would like to attend about using primary research in the classroom, um, please get in touch. Um, and that'll be happening in August. And again, it's a great opportunity for people to hear from different experts uh, in how, A, they use primary research in their classroom, B, why you should be using um, primary research in your classrooms, and C, like, how to do it. Um, because it, it's only so useful to say, hey, this is what you should be doing, um, instead of why and how can I do this. So just to wrap up about why we're around. <laughs> um, these are the different kinds of and, uh, standards and frameworks that teachers are working with, it can be kind of overwhelming to say like, wow, here's just some of what you have to be working with. How can I 
interpret it or what's like the relevance of these, the, these um, different standards. So it can be useful f to say like, um, here's, this, here's this original paper, this is published, this is like a real deal thing that scientists use to communicate with each other. How can I bring this in and how can I justify using this example? Um, and so that's something that we have in our educator guides to explain. And also I think people uh, appreciate that using, um, that annotating with us can be helpful in their own right to say that, you know, this is, this is uh, value added for me. Um, this is a quote from one of our, um, one of our annotators recently. So again, kind of the same thing for these scientists who are annotating. Um, this can be useful for them to say, hey, like, you know, I want to show that I can talk, that I can talk about research to students, to a general audience, um, and at a high technical level. There's a lot of scientific communication out there that is more about translating. So it's like, hey, here's this um, scientific research paper. Let me distill it down to a paragraph. Um, that is totally valuable as well, but to be able to keep it at a very high level and accessible level for students to be able to, that is, can be really difficult, and I think annotated, annotation can really help to break that down for students. Okay, so I just want to highlight all of our partners that we work with, most importantly, Hypothesis. Not most important, but you know. Um, they're really critical to the work that we do, and uh, we couldn't do it without them. So. Yeah, if anyone has any questions or wants to get in touch, please let me know. And just so we know, we are running a little bit behind schedule, but we do welcome people to um, ask questions for the full presentations like Lydia's. Any questions? Yeah. So annotations popping up in those little dark ones. Mm -hmm. uh, hypothesis. How did that? Yeah. Uh, Sidebar. Yeah. So. Um, so. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just asking about the how the annotations look like there were little pop-ups on the page and not the yeah. sidebar. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we are. That's part of the design of our website. Basically, is so that we use Hypothesis as, as an editor, as a creator of these annotations, and then once we um, know who the users are, or who the profiles are that we want to. Um, so it's not like if you want to use your hypothesis account to create an annotation on our paper, that won't automatically pop up as one of the annotation pop-ups. Um, we have to, you know, verify um, your annotation. It has to be tagged correctly with our different um, categories of tags. And, uh, and then it's, again, like that's a separate feature of our website is pulling those hypothesis annotations and bringing them into our learning lens is what we call them. Yeah. More questions for Lydia? Let's give her another round of applause.